Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this first assembly 2021. I am privileged to be joined by speakers from all over the world. Um, to my right, and I hope this is your right as well, um, we have Monica Narula joining us from India um, and uh, celebrating Diwali um, today. Um, and as we think about light, um, we're thinking about a moment we're moving away from a darkness, a period of around 21 months that, uh, while dark, also clarified what some of our priorities ought to be through questions uh, of public health and also the creation of publics, therefore, um, which is um, the premise um, of very much um, and very many of the conversations to come at this assembly. We're also perhaps led by a clarity about how care and repair needs to function for ourselves in our relationships um, and in the wider public, including institutions. So um, welcome, Monica, um, from uh, uh, the Rocks Media Collective to my immediate left. Um, we have Paul O'Neill, who's joining us from um, Publix, uh, a curatorial uh, innovation, um, I hope um, I may say so, um, from Helsinki. And uh, Paul will speak to us about para-hosting and how institutions could connect and relate in different ways. And to my far left, uh, we have Chris Creighton Kelly um, of Vancouver Island, speaking to us from his experience of diversity practices and indigenization um, from primary colors. Before we begin, um, perhaps we can take a moment to think about the ways in which um, light and darkness have entered and uh, impacted our lives in the past while. We would each have respective experiences that we might conjure at this moment. For myself, I am grateful to have been sustained by the abundance and the abundant tensions on these unceded ancestral traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. And as we think together about how care, repair, love and light could be centered and actually drive the way that we come together. Hopefully our gathering could yield community over the coming three days. That is our hope at any rate. And um, we will now um, turn to our three speakers, each of whom will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes in part some of the insights, the wisdoms, the questions, and also the problems and the questions that we want to create anew. We will take a short break uh, from 10.45 to 11 o'clock and move into a space where the movement of thought in this room could be embodied and really be live um, and felt. After that, we return at 11 for a conversation. So as we move through the space and time, um, please keep ideas present. If it helps, uh, please add uh, resonances in the chat and so that we can keep each other um, sustained, if you will. There will be a chance to ask questions um, towards the end. And uh, that would also come through the ask a question box that will emerge um, on the screen. So um, keep questions live and alive. Um, and as we continue, um, consider how each of us are situated in this conversation and how we want to situate this conversation in our daily lives and practices. So with this, I would like to yield the floor um, to Chris Creighton Kelly. Um, who will speak to us about uh, what it means uh, to decenter ourselves given the current climate um, of changing times. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sissy. And thank you, Alan, for inviting me to this panel. And uh, hello to Monica and to Paul. I wanna just pick up on what Sissy said there about um, 
positioning ourselves and decentering ourselves. I think it's very important that before we decenter, we position where we are. So the first thing I simply want to say is that I am on the land, the traditional territory, the unceded territory of um, the Sanic people. This is where I live on Vancouver Island, which is an island off the coast of North America, specifically near the Sarslip Nation. And I say that because it's become a kind of de rigueur practice in North America, but also because I am grateful to be here as a guest. And I benefit from uh, the, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the experience of indigenous people who live all around me. Secondly, I just want to briefly describe myself. I'm an older man, I'm a beard, a tiny bit of hair left. Um, I'm wearing a black shirt and a, a necklace um, given to me by a Syrian friend. I have earphones in my ears. Now, why do I do these two things? They seem very politically correct to do. But it's the beginning of a situation of putting myself into a positionality. It was something I think, using decolonial methods, we all need to do to first position ourselves so that we can decenter ourselves. And I want to start briefly by talking just a little bit about the work of John Powers. I realize this is not a, 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 a panel about that, but it helps to position myself. Primary Colors Couleur Primaire is a Canadian initiative in the Canadian art system that seeks to decenter whiteness and Eurocentricity and place at the center the indigenous practices of this land that have been here for millennia, art practices, cultural practices, and also to find uh, methodologies uh, for people of color, black artists that have come here from around the world as immigrants and now reside on this territory to put them and their practices into the conversation. We use the term IBPOC, which is a riff on BIPOC, which means indigenous black and people of color. Now within the Canadian context, those folks still remain a minority. Um, and we are accustomed to these somewhat insulting terms like visible minorities and racial minorities. But when we pull the lens out and look globally as we're doing today with my colleagues from two other parts of the world, that term kind of deconstructs itself. 60% of the world live in Asia. 17% live in Africa. In the Americas, North America eight, and South America 6%, that's 90% of the world's population. So it puts Europe and Eurocentricity in the Western world in a context where they are 10% of the world's population. And even if I agree for a minute, which I don't, <laughs> that Europe has got a white history, a Western white history, um, we have to take into account the many immigrants and migrants that arrive in these countries. So when we talk about minorities and majorities and what we're talking about, I think it has to be put into that global picture. At Primary Colors, we work, we would not have the pretense of saying that we work with indigenous um, methodologies, but indigenous influence methodologies. And that starts with the five R's. In every project that we do, in every performance that we commission, in every video that we commission, we try to work with respect, relevance, responsibility, relationality and reciprocity. The five R's are developed by indigenous scholars. They're not ours. I'll mention Linda Tawi Smith and uh, Sean Wilson, two people, but there are many other people that have developed the five R's. They're important principles. And it might mean that when we're working on a project and we see the relevance of it and there is no relevance that we stop the project. We also work with the four I's as we call them which are intergenerational at all our events. There's people from teenagers to people in their 80s and children running around. Um, we work in an interracial, intercultural way. We work intersectionally with other people whose voices are not always heard, like queer people, for example. Um, and we work interdisciplinarity uh, within the arts. We don't actually do panels. I'm on a panel today, but at Primary Colors, we don't do panels. We don't do keynotes. We don't believe in experts. Instead, we say that we do conversations and we do circles and we do polyvocality because we believe that knowledge is accumulated through everybody's input. And we do not believe in experts, but we do seek expertise. It's an important thing. And we also look at um, bodies of knowledge and how knowledge is constructed from different cultural and racial and ancestral traditions. 
So it's what, what Truffaut started to talk about with his idea of archaeology of knowledge. It was a very Western approach, but he started to hint at it and imagine that we look at the world through a worldview which is constructed by an archaeology of knowledge. And I think that can be moved out as Homi Baba and others have talked about um, into, into ways of seeing the world. We seek always at Primary Colors to be in a place of unknowing, not in a place of knowing, not in a top-down idea. I come to you today with questions, no answers, and I don't pretend to have a unified theory of, of what performance is or what performance art is. And we seek to be in a place of generative discomfort. So by not knowing, by unknowing, there's a discomfort in that. And that leads to questions of white fragility in the world and the defensiveness sometimes that takes place when we start these conversations. But we believe that that place is generative. It's a good place to be. It's a place where we can begin conversations, not end conversations. It's not a point of contention, but rather a point of departure. And finally, just to finish my little portion here on primary colors, we say that um, the diversity, inclusion, equity lens, which is so common throughout the entire Western world now, DIE or EDI or DIE, whatever way it's said, DIE must die. We must not be looking at methodologies to include, to get access to, but rather to decenter and decolonize. So that in the bringing in of all of the voices of the world, the systems themselves change, rather than the system staying the same, and just, you know, cosmetically changing. And finally, when we look at the practices of the people and colleagues that we work with, it's about 500 to 1,000 now, we talk about temporality. Hello. <laughs> um, in other words, what is time? Is time linear? Is it circular? Is it spiral? And look at different uh, ways of understanding what time is. We look at different worldviews. A worldview is a way to understand cultural meanings. We all have our stories when we travel the world about cultural uh, misunderstandings, uh, pan-cultural misunderstandings, where something can literally mean the opposite of what's intended. Well, we, we say that that polyvocality of archaeologies of knowledge is central to understanding where we are in the world today. We look at the relationship to community, and that uh, relates to Ellen's idea of the audience. I would suggest that the community from which work arises and the audience to which work is shared is not the same thing. And we, not, we cannot conceptualize it as one body of people. It's more like communities where work arises from that is then shared with audiences. That's an important uh, communications theory uh, point of view from cultural studies. Um, I won't list all the people that have influenced me there, but let's just say it's a cultural studies way of understanding. We look at the relationship of work to socioeconomic justice among IPOC people, because though it's not always connected to that, it's often and frequently connected to that. And finally, we look at um, a self-determined critical discourse. Rather than placing everything within the Western Eurocentric art world and how that art world, which is throughout the world now, understands and defines and, and frames things, we're actually trying to develop um, self-determined critical discourses here in Canada, but relating them to discourses that already exist around the world. So thank you for your patience with that. The reason I did all that was to, number one, just talk about my own positionality and how working with primary colors these last five or six years, excuse me, influences who I am and how I think. And again, it's about positioning myself so I can decenter myself. I'd like to ask the question in this COVID brain world that we live in, and this moment where we can pause and really look at things, when is performance? And I'd like to look at that from four perspectives. Again, I repeat that I don't have any answers. I'm not coming up with a unified theory. I'm not making an argument here. So I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. And I'm not winding up with and therefore believe like this. I have no pretense of having a unified theory, as I said. And especially not about performance. You, I use the term performance and not performance art because I think it encompasses more practices and deconstructs this idea of something called performance art and the arguments of did it begin with the, the dataists in Switzerland or the dataists in Paris and 
it just deconstructs that whole history, even though, of course, it's present. Um, yes, and as I said, I don't, I don't really want to come up with a unified theory of something called performance, which in its own way, among other things that it is, is kind of like the, the garbage can of visual arts, or if you want to be more poetic, it's the jazz venue of visual arts, where all kinds of practices come from different traditions and different uh, disciplines into something called performance. I want to take uh, 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 take us back, 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 all of us go back, not just those of you who are indigenous. I want about. I, I want to go back, back to when we all sat around fires. All of us. Some of us still do. When we were hunter-gatherers. When we tried somewhat laboriously and somewhat effortlessly to speak. And gesture. And move. And in those moments around that fireplace, around recounting the stories, the storytelling of the day, art was born. Was that performance? Was those gestures, those stories, those sounds, those dances, that interaction in the flame, was that performance? In fact, maybe it's more useful to think about artistic practice and particularly performance, less in terms of disciplinary boundaries, which after all are a Western invention that didn't exist before uh, colonialism and probably won't exist into the future. So they become kind of a blip on the radar screen of history, and yet we seem confined by them. So-and-so is a dancer, so-and-so is a theater artist, so-and-so is a visual artist. And think rather of the breakdown of every artistic practice, every art form, in terms of gesture, movement. So easily we can see dance that way, but we can also see the movement of a, a paintbrush on, on, a, on a piece of paper or on canvas. Or the, what happens when someone plays music and they're moving their body or when they're singing. Also sound, again, go back to that fireplace. An image. Image can be created through storytelling. It can be created through a visual image, through cave paintings, through performance in today's world. And eventually that brought us as a species to the word, the written word. Many theorists suggest that that's the point where we kind of lost track of our relationship to ancestral knowledge and indigenous knowledge. But that's a conversation for another day. So these four elements, the gesture, the image, the sound, and the word, can construct an art form and an art practice and an art moment right now, for example, which is not about disciplines. And I would suggest to you that no matter what your practice is, it involves those four things. And in the last 100, 150 years, we have this new notion of how uh, we make art through reproductive media starting with the camera and moving all the way up to where we are today with AR and VR. So those five factors, four of them ancestral, or three of them ancestral, let's say it that way, the written word beginning, I don't know, a few thousand years ago, and now the reproductive media, um, constitutes the making of art in the world we, we live in now. But I think it's important to have that grunting around the fire, speaking, women speaking, women to daughter speaking, fireplace that we all descend from. The second way that I'd like to imagine that we could open this question of when is performance is by peeking around the world, just turning our head. We're already around the world on this panel. But if we do it from wherever our positionality is, images will pop immediately into our head. I'm thinking of a, a sadhu in India who's got his or her hand up in the air like this and hasn't taken it down for 15 years. Is that person doing performance? When is performance? I'm thinking of a Greek farmer who's tending her sheep 
um, and just walking on the island of Crete and us walking by or driving by, looking at that person, watching their actions, understanding something about how they live. Is that a performance? When is performance? I'm thinking of a Japanese buto dancer who right at this moment might be on a stage or more likely outside or beside a building, contextualized by all of that history and we're watching, is that performance? Or I'm thinking of, I don't know, um, a Nigerian woman who has a vessel which she's walking three kilometers to go get water for the day. So someone's saying to me, performance is when the artist says it's performance. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I don't know that artists themselves define the meaning of what they're doing. I think that's one of the arrogances of Western art. I think there's a relationship between what is offered and what is received, what Marina Abramovich calls the audience completing the performance. So the meaning is not entirely in intentionality. That's my response to whoever that is there chatting. So I would ask you to think about that, to think about a, a Haida, which is one of the indigenous peoples of Canada, matriarch placing her hands like this, or more likely like this. Um, and in that moment, after ceremony, after their silence in the longhouse, is that a moment of performance? When is performance? I would also like you to think about when is performance from a third perspective, which is of course the, the world we live in, that we all live in today, which is the digital world. This digital world right here, this little screen. Green. green. This world in which the embodied, and I know, Sissy, one of your questions relates to this, the live element of the embodied human, is it transmitted virtually? Can it be? Can it be in these environments that we've lived in during the pandemic, um, the complete idea of what performance is, where we cannot touch one another, we cannot smell one another, we cannot feel the energy of one another in a way that we can when we're in a room. And I, by saying this, I don't mean to privilege face-to-face -face communication, but I do just want to ask that as a provocation. I want to talk about briefly the idea of live art and live art as being one of the definitions of performance. And many people now for a few decades have been using digital forms going back to video and television and now AR and VR and AI to enact their performances. So is it a question of only being live? Is it a question of being hybrid? Or can performance actually exist virtually? I was on a panel last week at something called the Talking Stick Festival in Vancouver. And I was moderating a panel on residencies. And people were talking about residencies and the relationship to land. Indigenous people always emphasize land. And one of the panels, panelists kind of up, upended the conversation by saying, yeah, but when I'm in VR, what territory am I on? What does that relationship to land and from land, I wanna challenge myself here because from land comes peoples, from peoples comes language, from language becomes culture, and then finally art, art being a, a kind of specialized form of culture, a specific form of culture depending uh, on the cultural background. And he upended the panel by saying this because people were putting such emphasis on territory and land. So I just leave you with that idea and the thought of what it actually means when you're in virtual environments, whether they be like the one here or even more immersive virtual environments, um, what territory are you on? And finally, I would like to briefly talk about, um, oh, what's this? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I just got a message that um, we are living in such a glut of information world, such a disinformation world, that the amount of information that is now stored 
for us to view, to look at, to understand, to research, is now greater than the time left in history to do it. So we passed something just now, interestingly, on this panel, um, where we don't have enough time to look at everything there is to look at. Um, and that creates a kind of problematic about understanding and about performance. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, I'd like to bring us back to Eurocentricity and return what I've just said to the notion of uh, Western art history and uh, what is performance in that context. Again, I emphasize not using the word performance art, the term performance art. And I want to say that um, this relationship of communities, plural, to audience is central to our conversation over the next three days. I've already said that once, but I want to expand it briefly by saying that an action that does not arise from a community and that does not have an audience, can we talk, this is an endless debate in the performance art world, is that still a performance? The, the kind of performance art version of if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? If nobody's there, does it make a sound? And talk about that in terms of understanding how to look at different audiences and conceptualizing audiences differently. And hopefully in the second half, we can, we can dive into that. And finally, I just, I just want to, with this overwhelming amount of information, I think I just want to stop. Thank you, Chris. I'm not finished. I'm just stopping. I'm asking us to be together in this silence. For inviting us into silence as we continue to think and to ponder as we feel time. The crucial. I just ask my is final in. question, Sissy. My final question is if the operative question of the 20th century, in a Duchampian sense, was what is art? How can objects be art? Then I think in the 21st century, we have to ask when is art? And no practice is more appropriate to answer that question. When is art is performance? When is performance? Sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to say that last thing. Thank you. Not at all. Thank, Thank you, you, Chris. And the way in which um, the polyvocal comes together, perhaps also in here is in the polyphonic that it is all right, completely all right, to interrupt, to speak with, um, and really to stutter together, backwards, forwards, um, horizontally, um, rhizomatically. So thank you for coaxing us into that space. And uh, perhaps on the point of the call and the response uh, that uh, might be a feature of how we define um, a moment of performance, I'd like to invite um, Monica um, to take the floor, um, to continue to push us into that urgent space, um, current political, artistic, creative spaces, um, by questioning the ways in which um, time functions and urgencies function, especially when it comes to epistemic disobedience um, starting with um, what Chris asked us to rethink about what the definitions and the contours of performance and performance art can be. So over to you, Monica. Thank you for being here. Unmute. Thank you, Susie. Um, thank you very much for that, Chris. Uh, fantastic. Um, I'm here going to change the tenor of um, some of the things I want to talk about today. Start with the idea of conversation. Um, so we're in a collective, there's three of us, and there's a lot of conversation that we have with each other. And one day we asked ourselves, what would it be if the digital versions of ourselves, how would we see the conversations that happen between our computers, between the three of us? So we invited um, a, a colleague from Cyber Mahalla, Suraj, a, a, a programmer, uh, 
to render this conversation that happens between our computers. Um, and of course, as we all know, when you talk to each other, you're talking to history, you're talking to the world. And um, this is the kind of rendition of one afternoon that began to happen, these lines. Uh, and we asked ourselves, what is this idea of a single line? And does it even exist? And do we ever really talk only to one person? Um, and it brought uh, to mind, at least for us, the idea of a thicket. Uh, a thicket is a concentration of living matter. In forests and gardens and fields, thickets rise where different plant species find it possible to thrive together in a wild celebration of life. And conversations too can be thickets, points of intersection of lines of force. The illusionary dis um, a distance of perspective is gone. Uh, the sort of the idea of perspective that we have understood uh, through the training that we have received for many generations is gone. Um, the mapping showed us that there are other histories, of course, that we know of different perspectives. If you take a look at Indian miniatures, for example, but what the rendering showed us was that um, that the redoing is also a realignment and not merely a resurfacing. So uh, we were invited uh, some years ago to, uh, uh, to do a project where we were asked to think about a relationship uh, and activate a relationship with public. And so we thought about everybody, anybody um, making a mark. People were invited to make uh, marks, cover the space, floor, wall, ceiling, windows, as much as is possible but in three dimensions. And what again emerged uh, was the same pattern, if you will, uh, which had developed from the rendition of our conversation of our computers having a conversation with each other and therefore, of course, having a conversation with the world because each thing goes across the world and comes back to, uh, to the person sitting right next to you in the same room. Um, and for us, this concentration of lines, this diagram of an intensely Conversational practice of being in the world is a sign of and for our time. And in a sense, this, this, this drawing led to a kind of different kind of drawing room, uh, not a room for withdrawal, which is what the word drawing room with drawing room comes from, of turning your back to the world, but a room turned into a drawing where people could perform animated exchange of thoughts and ideas, but also find moments of repose. And this, um, performance of thought in this instance was also a performance of gesture, was also a performance of line. Um, I want to move here to another idea that we worked with, which is the idea of theory opera. Um, with this phrase, uh, phrase theory opera, we wanted to raise the idea of performative thought, of becoming a mode of listening to hibernating histories of debate and argumentation all the histories of those that could transform the way we think of histories of, of thought because there are hidden genealogies of concepts, the relationship between reason, intuition, and the fabulous, for example, or between thought and human practice. Um, and we began this first with this before, I mean, this was where we became uh, articulate with the idea of theory opera, where we, we did a staging of uh, Jimena Canales' rewriting of the conversation, the debate that happened between Einstein, Einstein and Bergson um, in the 1920s in Paris, I believe. Uh, what we said was, uh, when theory gets to work, it sings. Um, by, by using the word singing, we are sort of changing the expectation from the idea of theory. The theory opera aimed to explore the sensuality of thought. These were live scenarios that we envisaged that would happen within the exhibition space of the Shanghai Biennale, which we were curating. Uh, it, it was called Why Not Ask Again in 2016. And various kinds of theory operas were performed or enacted at intersections of artworks or within artworks or uh, you know, within the museum or outside the museum or even within the city uh, of Shanghai throughout the duration of the biennial. And actually, um, some other modes that are excavations of our excavations of performative thought have included arguments from the Sanskrit corpus, 
um, between Gargi, a woman who was a passionate questioner of the tyranny of abstract categories. Uh, she kept saying why. And Yagna Valkya, a cold idealist um, that, uh, was played, that is played out in, in, in one of the Upanishads. And then um, what I had begun with showing in the theory of opera was this conversation that we read it between Ibn Sina or Avicenna and Al Biruni, um, where, which is a thousand year old conversation. They were writing letters to each other in 999 AD. And they were talking about ideas that are still actually playing out in modern and contemporary thoughts, such as the consideration of infinity and how infinity necessarily entails the, the inner the admissibility, sorry, of many worlds other than our own. And of course that holds not just for, I mean, it holds as much for uh, the things that um, surround us in this world, in, you know, in the room next door as much as they do uh, outside of our own planet. Um, and to move from, from theory opera, from tickets and theory opera to the, to this, to 5 million incidents that you can see over here, where we were interested in hibernation, excavation, lateral movements that can become a collective endeavor, activated in a sustained way within an institutional location, um, and in a in a different way, in a different order, I suppose, than the ones that we did. When an in invitation to uh, such as that for Thicket, which was within a specific kind of project history or a project space, then to Shanghai Biennale, but it had a you know it had a, a certain kind of arc where we were the ones sort of locating it within the city. And here, 5 million incidents was actually more than a year long. Uh, so the time frame has been changing from, from a few days of ticket to a few months of, of why not ask again, now to uh, almost two years of 5 million incidents or over two years of 5 million incidents. Where there's a possibility, where, what we were interested in, the possibility of a different register of amplitude when played out, um, where we are also looking at the idea of time being non-sequential and we ask, what is an incident? Instead of a series of moments on a timeline, uh, which follow necessarily one after the other, it is possible to think of an incident as the extension of a fungal tendril, a quickened heartbeat, an epiphany, a flash of insight, an outbreak of goosebumps, a moment of excitement and a current, an encounter, a sighting, a memory. An incident can be anything that transforms the way we live or think, a conversation that carries a surge in its wake. Uh, and an event that makes us rethink everything. Millions of incidents can populate a duration, making it come alive as an embodiment of a reordering of temporal sensations, such that mere chronology, the question of what comes after what, is held momentarily in abeyance. So finally, an incident in which we did in Delhi, or not only in Delhi, but Delhi and Kolkata, we saw it as a scrambling of temporal orders, as triggers of the awareness of a challenge, that stratigraphy, that stratigraphy, that you know, layering, um, the challenge that layering, that stratigraphy brings to chronology and how inhabited layers of time deflect the straight arrow of time, that there is perhaps, um, never a straight arrow of time. And how can one create situations that challenge such, a, such an idea of time? So over 20 months, approximately 100 artists created assemblies in the Maxwell Bhavan, also known as the Goethe Institute in uh, Delhi and Kolkata. Uh, FMI, these open up a remarkable possibility of thinking of uh, questions of artistic peer relationships, crucially of occupation of time as art, um, of the blurring of lines between the event of art and daily life. I mean, should they be considered separate at all? Of inventing fresh protocols of institutional custodianship uh, because we uh, basically took over the entire space, the entire building, um, all the spaces of the, of the Goethe Institute for, for this long. Um, so five million lasted hours, it lasted days, weeks, months, through artworks, actions, and performative moves that renewed and transformed terms of co-inhabitation of multiple presences. So for us, a five million incidents 
is a mode of a conscious engagement with time by changing the relationship that you have with each other also in space. Uh, in, a, in an essay we wrote about our experience of 5 million, we argued, there is an urgent need to produce milieus that welcome and sustain a multiplicity of practices with the comfort and confidence of durational, incremental, and layered artistic acts, which build in cascade. This momentum of accretive density leads to the proposition that artistic practices are best expressed in a perennial state, like perennial forest. Their conjoining intensities of mode and disposition produce a ground for the, for the emergence of new values of care and disorientation for a new, contem for a new contemporary. So not, or not a question of reorientation, but disorientation for a new contemporary. And there's a, there's a difference between being a facilitator to art practices, which is what most institutions are trained at, and being a host. Um, the host cultivator gardener who tends to time. And it is this difference that we were primarily interested in bringing uh, to the attention of the Max Miller or the Goethe Institute when they invited us to, well, they invited us and said, you're welcome to take over this space and do what you like. And this is, uh, this is what emerged. This receptivity to the unpredictable consequences of the presence of the catalyst um, and permitting that presence and, and permitting this unpre unpredictability is the marker of hospitality, which manifests itself as the willingness of the host to be a player in response to the moves initiated by the guest catalyst. But in this case, starting with rock, but then uh, spiraling into or rippling into many, many more. In several of our languages in this part of the world, the word for guest is atiti. This is an idea that we have in that we have been invested in because it is also a paradox. The anticipation of the unpredictable because um, anticipation or premonition is the awareness of the unknown or even the unknowable. It does not claim to know, it claims to sense and to create a structure of sensate orientation to what is yet to be known. Um, so the word titi in Hindi on Sanskrit and many other languages, it means date, a conjunction where you can expect something to happen. The guest or a titi is essentially the one who comes unannounced without prior notice. This means that the ethics of hospitality is crucially premised on being prepared to be open to the unpredictable. The idea of unpredictability is contrary to a regime of predetermined predictable sequence where a clear chain of cause and effect can be planned for uh, from, you know, from earlier in time between one event and the next and across a chain of moments and occurrences. The unpredictable, on the other hand, brings with it the idea that there may be more than one future latent within every present moment, that, there's, that the fullness of, of every moment is, is permitted. And that temporal succession and simultaneity and the relationship between past, present, and the future, and between more than one present, are as much a matter of subjectivity and desire as they are, you know, what we have, as what we have been planning for or programming for. So five million incidents extended our public invitation, first to a group of engaged artists, architects, curators, and teachers, and we invited them to constitute a collegial think well, not a think tank, but a think well that read and argued um, hundreds of proposals that were actually, that came from the public call and acted as interlocutors for the artist projects that were uh, invited. Um, then we sent out a public call and the order of the call, of course, as we all know, makes for the order of the response. And we asked people to reflect on what an incident is, that's all you, that's what you came with as a, as a proposition. And also the relationship of time to the idea of an incident. Is it an afternoon? Is it a day? Is it a month? Uh, we also ask people to, you know, be open to what space could be imagined for the playing out of, of an incident. And we ask, you know, and, and I, when I say about the order of call, I mean, we said, for example, please bring in a, a letter of, uh, not a recommendation, but a letter of uh, support or of um, 
uh, just yeah, but by a peer though, not by someone, by someone who's your equal, someone who who would be so you know someone who would you would have a conversation with, and not by someone who's um, older or wiser or well known or so on. And then the collegium became instigated the scaling and fine detailing of what all the things that went down in the five million incidents. Um, so you can see the kind of the range of space and, and duration that that happened. Um, and crucially, of course, as we know, the five million incidents stretched across the extraordinary time of 2019 and 2020, of 2018 starting, but also 2019 and 2020, where there was turbulence and upheaval in India and the world, um, not just uh, the obvious uh, question of the pandemic, but also economic meltdown, social anxiety. Um, there has been a, a criminal criminalization of dissent. Um, against this setting, the exploitation of non-rivalrous and egalitarian modes of the acceptance of others as co-inhabitants in time asserts the desirability of porous and intimate context of co-creation. How do we learn to live together? Yielding polymorphous fields made up of many minor movements and transformations. It's not always the big things. It is um, how does one occupy time together in the world that we find ourselves? And in that mode of occupation is the possibility of transformation. Um, I would like to briefly well, no, no, no. this is not an end, perhaps, because this is something that is continuing. Hungry for Time is an exhibition that is presently on right now in Vienna, um, which we uh, call an invitation to epistemic disobedience in epistemic disobedience, taking of course from Walter Mignolo's uh, ideas, uh, but an invitation to epi disobedience, epistemic disobedience with us in the collections of the Academy for Art in Vienna, which is the oldest art school in that part of the world, functioning art school. And it has a collection that goes back 200 years, uh, more than 200 years, but artworks that go back hundreds of years. Um, so the introduction, I want to just read briefly from that. It says, one of the conceits of empire has been a division of space on the basis of time. This assumption has it that those located in ex or post imperial centers such as Vienna have a head first advantage as well as a finger on the trigger of the starter's gun in time's marathon run. The world, however, has never been entirely attentive to this narrative of the starter gun. Generations may have worked to move into the story, but they have equally struggled to abort or pause the race or to take this story apart. Hungry for Time works with images and objects in the collection of the Academy der Bildenden Kunste, interpolating responses to them as an opportunity to call in and praise acts of epistemic disobedience by which many protagonists of the world disorder and disassemble ways of seeing and acting. This is a process of derangement, an imagining of new configurations of interruptions, annotations, superimpositions, aberrant stances and moves, and shifts of scale. Through a cascade of scenes that we have worked with, like there's, there's 10 scenes in the exhibition, um, a scenes of recombinant energies that convene and dissolve the collections in the hierarchies, the master and the copy, the eternal and the discardable, the processual and the absolute, uh, with contemporary artworks and with the reading of documents in the latent archives, a new milieu gets anticipated for thinking, for feeling, for orienting bodies to world and to time. Visitors are invited to this discontinuous temporal relay of breaks and detours in the museum's collection. And as we say, they are welcome then to a procedure for time and to the sensation of what it means to be hungry for time differently. Pulsating seismic tremors, relays, transmission, and translation are manifest in diverse, intriguing, and troubling ways. Um, we can talk about some of these ideas, but I just want to leave you with just a couple of walks in the 
in the in the exhibition. But I just want to mention the fact that this the idea this that we've talked about this indifferently is this this privilege of lag that some some places in the world claim to have, so that they can pursue their own heritage and taste and judgment. This privilege has been subverted now by the intense entanglement and corrosion of cosmologies and histories. And that is what the exhibition is doing for us. Because unmaking haunts all making, streets disrupt universities, epistemic hegemony has given way to a milieu of epistemic disobedience. Time story once told is never enough. The hunger to gobble up time leads to the obliterating of a plural life of time. There is thus a blackmail of the wrong horoscope of time. How does this hunger move? And how does it leave its mark? Thank you. It's lovely, the sound of many hands, many virtual hands clapping. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Chris, for bringing us um, to different parts of the world, to different traditions, the kind of practices that come together, that pattern us and the contemporary in the French sense of temps as time and also temps as weather. So there's something that um, feels um, seismic if we will. The kind of unsettling and the sitting in the generative discomfort that allows um, different ways of being, new ways of coming together, and also different constellations of, um, as Monica prompted us, um, to host, understanding the different attitudes that are required um, that calls us to remain open while feeling solid enough to be able to take and to receive, to respond to calls, but also to issue calls, if you will. We are at around 1041 at the moment, and um, Paul has been very um, patient and generous and uh, has agreed um, to start his talk after the break, such that we have a moment to really um, feel time I think both Chris and Monica is calling us to do so. And uh, in, in that gesture, if you will, um, as we continue to think about um, all the incidentals and the incrementals that would bring us um, to a conversation that might transform the way that we think about being together and how institutions can function. Um, we are going to be invited um, into a different setting in a few minutes time where performance artist uh, Margaret Dragu with two of her, her guests are going to help us um, feel the weight of thinking in our body, find and refine and perhaps center and recenter um, gravity and how thought weighs and also lightens us um, such that we could come together um, in back in this room for the second part of the panel where we're going to start um, with uh, Paul speaking about para-hosting as um, an institutional form and how transformative it can be um, as a concept, a technique, um, protocols, if you will, and also uh, perhaps a new framework for us to think about being together for each other. So with that, um, I am going to pass the technical threads of the room um, to Brian, who's going to move us um, into our- place. Yes, thank you, yes, Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just check Margaret's ready, vamp for another 60 seconds, and I'll be right back. And meanwhile, thank you very much, Yasmin, um, for all the links. 
uh, as well as uh, the responses and the resonances um, that are coming through. So um, yeah, um, please put in those keywords um, and those phrases that actually become lines of flight for us as we move to discussion in the second part of the panel. Are we all ready? Yes, Sissy? OK, let's go. Remember, and it's easy. Uh, OK. We are all here, Margaret. Oh, you're all there? OK, yes. great. Hi, hi, everybody. It's time for our greeting. Now, I, I don't know how to turn my camera out of mirror mode. So this is a bit uh, hieroglyphic. But it says, greeting. My name is Margaret Dragu, and I'd like to introduce you to my two artists and my dear friends, Francisco Fernando Granados and Johanna Householder. Hi, you guys, how you feeling? Feeling good, ready. If you want, ready. If you want to, you can just shake your yeah yeahs out before we begin. Uh, and everybody else, if there's something else you would rather do, if you'd like to take a walk or a nap or have a smoke, please do that. This is time for you to repair and be cared for. But if you'd like to stay with us, we'd like that because we are going to do a little very gentle exercise in breathing. But first, three, three safety things to take into account. First, because I'm a BCRP instructor, I should tell you that you should look at a PARQ form at least once a year to check your general health and readiness for exercise. And that's in the bottom left corner of your screen here on Verbfrau TV in our room. If you click on that, it'll come up. You'll see seven questions. I would suggest looking at them at some point, maybe now or later. And then when you're finished on the top right corner is an X. And you can push that and the PARQ form will go away. The second safety thing is please use a safe chair, not an office chair that rolls around. A wheelchair is fine. A four-wheel walker is fine as long as you've got the brakes on. But really, just a stable chair is really much better. And the third thing is please have a cell phone or another phone. Show your cell phones, Johanna and Francisco. They know the safety number in Canada. What is it? It's 911. 911. 911, right on. 911 in Canada, but it could be a very different number where you are. So please make sure that you know what that number is. And I am now going to turn my cell phone on so I can set the timer. And I am going to ask our fabulous DJ, Brian, you're there, right, Brian? For our original music by Sarah Sheard. And I've got my cell phone on. That's the clock on the bottom. So we're going to get started, everybody. It's now time for doing Yes, just I, play, I with, will play with the volume as you like. Yeah, with, yeah. Not to worry, we're going to get started. We're going to sit tall on the chair. Put your hands any way you want them. On your thighs, in your lap, on your belly, wherever. They could hang. And take a moment to wiggle your toes just like you're at the beach and you're wiggling the toe, your toes in the sand. And then relax those toes and connect the whole foot into the ground. The left foot and the right foot are like roots, reaching in. Close your eyes if you like. And find your breath. Follow the inhale and the exhale. Enjoy the inhale and the exhale. 
and wiggle those toes again connect to the feet turn the abs on by lifting the belly button lightly into the back of the waist and now we're tall if your eyes are closed open them now and we're gonna let the eyes lead let the eyes look to one side doesn't matter which and let the head follow sit tall and breathe and look over your shoulder as if you're looking for traffic or people or pets children birds keep breathing and bring the head back to center and let the eyes look the opposite way and the head will follow take a big breath here and let it out bring the head back to center we're going to drop the chin down to the chest you'll feel perhaps a gentle stretch in the back of your neck lift the heart up to the sky and breathe and then guide the chin up to our neutral looking at the camera position and then the chin gently goes up to the ceiling to stretch through the front of the throat like a cat and then bring the head back and let it balance on top of your whole spinal column effortlessly we're going to drop the hands to the side and stretch the fingers to the floor and inhale and bring the arms to a T shape flip the hands so the fingers are up in that stop in the name of love Dinah Ross position and turn a magic doorknob back and back to neutral and forward and make sure you're breathing I'm going to do that two more times don't do anything that hurts this should feel good and we're moving right at the very top of our arm where it meets the shoulder turn the palms up now connect the feet the abs and the breath and inhale and reach up and we'll reach straight through the ceiling to the sun gather the hands in and bring them back to heart center inhale get taller exhale turn to one side doesn't matter which breathe through the belly if you can breathe any way that's comfortable through your ears if you prefer and come back to center inhale get tall exhale turn gently to the other side and come back to center hands back on the thighs remembering at any time if you want to stop moving and doing the stretches you can just stay here and sit and be aware of your breath breathing is moving and if you are aware of your breath as you're breathing you are actually doing yoga which is just the intersection and yoking of breath and movement if you like take the hands down to the side and guide one hand down the front leg of the chair until you tilt to that side you can stay here if you like anchor back into both bums and if you like you might add an arm raise to a t-shape you're getting a stretch through the side of the neck and through the side body let's just wiggle our arm that is extended a bit as if we're mermaids and mermen and mer people just waving our fin our tail in the water just a bit you'll might feel different sensations in your shoulder lower this arm turn the abs on if they're not already and float back up to center rolling the shoulder back and forward and we'll do the other side this hand's going to go down 
the front leg of the chair just as far as is comfortable for you today. Breathe. Extend the free arm in space, not too high. And if you like, swish the water a little bit. Encouraging some movement right in this area that I'm rubbing. That looks great, Francisco and Johanna. I wish we were someplace super warm where we were doing this in the water together. And still this arm. Strong abs as we float back up to center. Inhale and reach the arms forward as if you're reaching right to me. And weave the fingers together. You could stay here if your wrists were feeling uncomfortable today and just press your, the knuckles or turn them inside out. Inhale and on the next exhale, in fact, I'm going to get both of you to turn sideways, Johanna and Francisco, if you can, with your chair so we can see. That's perfect. You guys are just on the money. So here we are in our forward position with it. That's, you've got it, Johanna, you're in the right way. You've got the mirror figured out. Okay, we're gonna inhale. And we're gonna exhale and pull that belly button into the back of the chair, creating a C shape with the whole back. Not forcing, but allowing. So we're all making the letter C. Francisco's curving one way, Johanna's curving the other, and I'm curving forward at you. Keep pushing through the feet and keep the abs strong and inhale and stretch the palms away from you and up to the ceiling. Only as far as is comfortable for you and your elbows can be bent. There should be no pain here. So really bend those elbows. And if you, your neck does not like looking up, look forward instead. But we're having a big stretch here in cow. Release the hands and we're painting the walls with our hands as we bring them down to our sides. And we'll do that two more times. Inhale to float the arms, fold the fingers, exhale into cat. Oh, hopefully this feels really good. Inhale into cow, moo, and breathe as we spread the hands and paint the walls, slide and glide. Last one, inhale, float, exhale, cat, meow. Inhale, cow, and exhale, slide and glide those hands down and roll the shoulders back and the other way. Shake out the arms like they're wet noodles. And take one hand to the heart and one hand to the belly and find your breath. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. Listen to that music. and listen to your breath. We're going to do one more cleansing breath together. And Francisco and Johanna, open your eyes. Everybody else can leave theirs closed if you like. And you can turn forward, you guys. And we're gonna have a very quick chat. I'm gonna give you a, a question. What was your favorite caregiving activity that you did that you learned during the pandemic or started to do during the pandemic was it an exercise a meditation or something else off the top of your head francisco stretching with you and johanna and naps naps excellent johanna yes twice weekly meetings with you and francisco have kept me centered and uh, caregiving for my mother-in-law. Wonderful. That's great. Wonderful to hear those guys. I love you guys so much. You've kept me together during the pandemic. And now it's time, Brian, for Frugal Friday Flyer, how to eat cheaply 
but will. See you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks for dropping into Verbfrau TV. Thank you very much, Margaret. The ways in which um, the sounds and the smells and the movement and the breath come together brings us back um, to our panel. I'm remembering what Chris mentioned during his talk um, about the merging um, or the coextensiveness of gesture, image, sound, and word. And perhaps we had a, a, a quarter of an hour of a moment of that. So thank you, um, Margaret and friends. And I feel that a lot of the unknowing that Monica and Chris have encouraged us to embody is now resting perhaps a bit more evenly throughout our body. And without further ado, um, here is Paul O'Neill to speak about how institutions think and power hosting as a curatorial form. Over to you, Paul. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Sissy. And thank you, Elham. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Monica, uh, for your presentations. Um, I believe there's going to be a kind of a visual backdrop. Yeah. It is on its way. Apologies, patience. I will start. 
how institutions think is an issue of fundamental contemporary importance and one that needs to be addressed from multiple perspectives and with a new sense of urgency as appears here today and elsewhere. Culture and its publics as always plural as a concept, as a contested site, as a space of production and critique, and as a vast array of discourses and institutions in different parts of the world. In this sense, then, public culture has many times and many places. It is local and global, here and now, then and now, here and there. The teaching and learning of culture, therefore, as much as the studying of its disciplines, such as curating visual art, design, literature, theatre, performance, music, architecture, and all its multiple forms, more widely needs to continually question the dynamics between politics, education, research, artistic practices, and their institutions. A thinking of these relations is necessary both within and beyond the academy and the art institutional walls if we are to expand our comprehension of this present situation so that we can reimagine relations between the local, the global, the regional and national presence during a moment of increased inequality, separation and political fragility for human rights across the world. It is a time of increased discrimination structural violence and civic uncertainty. There is a desperate anxiety for those of us who actually believe in the values and merits of art, its education and its institutional forms and the agency and ability of art in its many diverse forms to critique, to transform and to impact the world in which we live. One of the biggest institutional challenges, I believe, is to make contemporary artistic practices more relevant to society so that we can play a significant role in challenging the many prejudices associated with difference and otherness, race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, and so forth, and to make our contemporary present more vital to the future. In recent decades, certainly within cultural discourses, we have seen much debate over institutional critique, new institutionalism, instituent practices, and self-organization. Most often these issues of institution have been apprehended through the categories of power, hegemony, hierarchy, control, value and discipline. Typically in these debates, we seem to reach an, an impasse or an impasse in the contemporary dialect or dialectic of institutionalized anti-institutionalism. That is instead, now it is important to look at propositions rather than reactions to a period of radical uncertainty and reactive securitizing control for us to imagine the present or the situation in new non-polarizing ways beyond increasingly anachronistic and narrow geopolitical terms. In her social anthropological work, uh, which is uh, perhaps rather unfashionable, Mary Douglas uh, wrote in uh, 1986 how institutions think. She argued that uh, in order to expand and reimagine numerous contemporary possibilities for and the lim limitations of institutional formats, practices and imaginaries where necessary. In the book, uh, I've uh, developed with Lucy Steeds and Mick Wilson also called How Institutions Think. We employed Douglas's work using her title and some of her arguments, both as a polemic or a polemical statement and as a loose framing device with which to look anew at thinking on institution. In particular, I am interested in how Mary Douglas describes how different kinds of institution allow individuals to think different kinds of thoughts and to experience diverse emotions. Writing that, for better or worse, individuals really do share their thoughts and they do have some, to some extent, harmonize their preferences and they have no other way to make the big decisions except within the scope of institutions they build." End of Mary Douglas quote. In reminding us that individual cognition is socially controlled, Douglas emphasizes our responsibility for the thinking we produce through the institutions in which we take part. Clear-sighted in her vision and what is entailed and what is at stake in the process of rethinking institution, Douglas acknowledges that solidarity is only gesturing when it involves no sacrifice. Hence, she poses a question for us. 
how are we to build and sustain institutions for art that equip ourselves and others to, do, to be aware of our inherent contradiction and yet still be able to make big decisions? Douglas is less a foreboding omnipresence than a proximate specter. Taking up her theory of institution being a social contract or a social construct, we might begin by stating or starting to think itself, think, think about thinking itself as being dependent upon institutions. That is, there is no thinking without institution. Thinking acknowledges that when we think institution, however critically we imagine ourselves to be thinking, we are already implicated in an institutionalizing process and are formed or even confined by our experiences of institution. Proceeding from this point, we might hope to reconsider the practices, habits, models, revisions, and rhetoric of institution and anti-institution in contemporary curatorial and cultural discourses. By considering themes of epistemic practice, of cognition and social bond, of power knowledge, and of institution as an object of inquiry across multiple disciplines, including political theory, organizational science, and sociology. Some of the questions in need for further address include, is institutional building still possible, feasible, or desirable? Are there emergent future institutional models for progressive art and curatorial research practices? How do we legitimate or challenge institution? What do acts of constituting become and when do they become uh, the act of instituting? How do we know when institutions make decisions and whether their decisions are built upon ethical principles? Can we institute ethical principles and build institutions accordingly? If so, for whom are we building these future institutions? In what ways can we think extra-institutionally, contra-institutionally, non-institutionally, para-institutionally. How serious are we really when we claim to wish to build our future institutions together? Do we really care? Pedagogical or curatorial institutions such as the art academy, the museum, the gallery, the theatre are institutionally entwined, but more widely I've been asking myself, what is the institutional ba basis for arts exhibition? that is to say its experience, production and discussion in the public sphere. It is needed to look at all forums or hubs that operate over time to sustain arts capacity to question, provoke and inspire people in general, whilst defending the value of the cultural voice distinct from government and commerce. This means that we traverse the institutional field from the museum to the artistic collective, from the art academy to the research network and from the privately funded to the state sponsored, all while foregrounding cross-cutting initiatives. The tradition of curatorial development, certainly within Western Europe and North America or in the Eurocentric world, would conventionally point us towards a trajectory for and around art that starts with institutional critique in the late 60s and into the 1970s, then progressed to artist activist interventions in the 1980s and experiments in curatorial institutions, nihilism in the 1990s, with alternative spaces, self organizations, and instituent practices that re uh, reject formation, increasingly threading their way to become in between and beyond as we moved into the new century. The rise of the creative or cultural industries and indeed algorithmic institutions that respond to logistical capitalism and are thereby only nominally public bring us, bring us up to the present moment. While this, reject, while this trajectory has the merit of having been tested over many years and over the past years, it excludes as much as it includes and does not account for the ways in which already invested institutional types might suddenly offer themselves for full or partial revival under new circumstances at almost any moment. Allowing histories and forms of institution to reimagine or to be reimagined must be done in tandem with any mapping of new possibilities that present themselves in our current conditions, hearing and learning from specific places and practices that are perhaps less widely known can also offer some ways forward. 
It is useful to retain a productive tension between any attempts to think the historical modernist project as anchored in Europe for our post-Euro colonial times and the work of demodernizing and or looking elsewhere for anchors and historical mirrors that might inform institutions as they go forward. This tension is arguably one of the most important reasons why it might be foolish or it would be foolish to attempt to pin down a single institutional history that would inevitably reify certain practices or contingent decisions, whilst ignoring a wider field of political, commercial and globalizing pressures that force the hand of many institutional actors. For this reason, we should enable a breadth of positions rather than any fixed conclusions about institutional think thinking. With reference to the work uh, of Chantal Mouffe uh, to represent agonistic pluralism as a way of learning from one another. We might be able to build a thought collective such as a phenomena being most simply understood as a community or constituency of persons mutually exchanging ideas and maintaining intellectual interaction. As a call to reflect upon how institutional practices inform art, curatorial, educational and research practices, as much as how they shape the world around us. It is essential to implement a work together methodology, combining and sharing networks and knowledge resources, we might begin to conceptualize and build possible institutions or anti-institutions. At the same time, to be wary how any collective can itself verge upon institutionalization. So it's important to bring in new partners or voices or thinkers in our institutions at all times, regardless of how conflictual or divergent they may be to our own. More than considering how institutions think at present, we might ask, what are the models, resources, skills and knowledge needed to develop a new innovative and productive caring research led institution, is such a thing possible? Will it ever be? Can it be realized in tandem with its publics, its collaborators, its guests, or its para guests? Obviously, I believe such a model remains a real potentiality and is something we're trying to do in Helsinki with publics, which is an evolving cooperative research-based art project enacted together with others in public, in practice, in practice as a critical mode of listening, sharing and being open to a decolonizing of what we think we know by supporting the curatorial needs of others. More than ever, we, we need to look after each other, one another, and to take care of ourselves, or so the polemic goes. How can this spirit of curing and caring constitute a productive way of working together institutionally, organizationally or curatorially. One concrete way we've been doing this is through our para hosting program at Publix, which began in 2018 and has grown into a key model or method of decentering authorship or self critiquing Publix's own elective curatorial agency. As a para host, Publix offers its space its staff, its resources, its time, its knowledge and its funding to provide support for the curatorial ideas of others and to power host these initiatives who are in need of space to practice and to support the realizations of their projects publicly and who do not have the resources to do so. Public continues to host other, other peoples, other bodies and their ideas and allows its identities to be taken over and on many levels, we become preoccupied by our guests. Public takes, cares of, takes care of its parasites, its para institutions, its para guests. Its space continues to become increasingly the workspace of other curatorial initiatives. In a way, public's uh, identity shifts into the identities of other publics and their curatorial activities. Para hosting is therefore a flexible, evolving, expanding, and sometimes messy program of residencies, of performances, talks, and discursive events. Although it, it now has a list of protocols to adhere to, it often culminates in multiple educational formats and hybrid exhibition forms with many different levels of co-production. 
para guests have stayed with us for a day or a year, where we do what we can to make their proposals happen. Each guest brings uh, with them different needs, expectations, diverse ideas, and also divergent publics. One example of this is Public's year-long uh, project with Shimmer in Rotterdam, which began by us co-hosting a small exhibition of three sculptures by the artist Gordon Hall at Publix, alongside a performative reading of Gordon's writing with Gordon, Eloise Sweetman, and Jason Hendrik Homsna uh, from Shimmer in parallel to Shimmer's evolving exhibition, also involving Gordon's work in Rotterdam. Through extended dialogue between us about listening and reading aloud, this para hosting expanded into a much larger project called the Cross the Way With, which is a co-selected and expanding series of informal readings of, with, and about intimacy in the public realm, with readings by invited readers from across the world. The project originates in Shimmer's idea, but it is co-programmed, and together we are thinking about the texture of the voice, the rhythm of the body, the poetic and artistic forms of writing, and how these forms of intimacy can be voiced publicly. Together with Shimmer, we create or we help create a space that is both public and intimate, dialogical and digital, analog, distant and proximate. We create an online platform, we create an, now create an online platform, which is a support structure for the act of reading aloud for others and with others. And which we are planning already before which we are planning already before the current pandemic but somehow seems somewhat more timely now for the audience it is the intimate act of being read to to experience the intimate texture of the voice the rhythm of breathing the digitalized voice streaming to you in this way rather than creating a reading group for discussion we created a space for the phone in your pocket at work in the kitchen or on your laptop, laptop taken to bed. Across the way with is an evolving and expanding affinity archive as much as a place available to contemplate, to flesh out the possibilities of access, a site that goes beyond our individual networks and our own physical and spatial limitations. In recent years, we have seen a consolidation in the discursive field around curating where many protagonists are attempting to inscribe certain constructions, limitations and definitions of what curating should be or should seek to be and to determine which bodies of knowledge will have enduring consequences for the practice of curating and its parallel discourses and its histories. This tendency is particularly apparent in recent attempts to distinguish concepts of the curatorial from the paracuratorial that is with the para conceived as something that operates away from or alongside or supplementary to the main curatorial work of making exhibitions. The curatorial is always a constellation of activities as the main public event. Para curatorial practices are part of this constellation, but could also be considered a type of practice that responds to certain irreconcilable conditions of production, often with emerging practices as productive agencies. Paracuratorial practices attach themselves to intervene in or rub up against these conditions. It can be a doing, it can be a doing things on the hoof or without rigid methods or without any set outcomes. They might occur at the points uh, at which the main event is critiqued from within or when the restrictive scenarios into which art and curatorial labor are forced or sidestepped in some way. They employ a host and guest, a host and uninvited guest tactic of coordination and invention, enabling parasitic curatorial labor to coexist alongside or in confrontation with pre-existing cultural forms, originating scenarios or prescribed exhibition contexts. Para hosting is forms of practice of doing something other than, beside, outside, or auxiliary to, operating at a distance from the main act of exhibition curating. Through acts of listening and taking care of para guests, para sites, and para institutions, para hosting is now an essential means of working together without boundaries or containments. It proposes being central of how we can speak or work without prioritizing our own authorship 
and as a progressive terrain for organizational praxis that both operates within the curatorial paradigm and retains a destabilizing relationship to it via paratexts, sites, works, and institutions. In this sense, para-hosting is a useful term to describe transitional temporal processes of engagement with people taking precedence over exhibitions or productions as the primary end product. In the face of such a reductive scenario, para-hosting proposes an ever-changing field of operations that persists in resisting the established order of things as part of a destabilizing curatorial constellation. That's the end of my polemic. And um, what you see in the background is, is maybe images, wallpaper images uh, to uh, give a sense of where our hosting has been taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, this all conjures uh, this idea um, and uh, right back um, to Elham's opening when she uh, cited Hannah Arendt, the way in which Arendt thinks about institutions as a space between um, working and making and action. So uh, in fact, uh, what is institutional is exactly the in-between and insofar as institution still has a function and is still relevant, it is because it presents those structures, whether it is a concrete wall or a digital wall or a frame through which we are able to interact, engage, perhaps um, without discipline, um, drawing from Chris's talk, um, not seeking for announcement from Monica's talk, and then not seeking to be contained not something to be predefined um, per Paul's talk. Uh, I'd love at this point for um, everyone um, who is in the space with us to share any questions or comments. Um, Brian, I think um, we'll be able to activate uh, ask a question box. So if you have a question to ask and wish to vocalize it, please just click that button that you see um, and you will be placed and moved into um, that particular uh, segment of the frame. But perhaps to start, um, if I may pose a question um, to all of our speakers, the same one. How do you yourself, as somebody who is um, established and recognized for having done something, so here we're talking about the cumulative effects um, of past experiences, and practices, um, take on and negotiate um, the space where you innovate, think, rethink, learn, unlearn um, with others to be sure, interlocutors, partners, um, para guests. And that particular comportment that you have in order to continue to speak, um, as someone um, who is established in your field. So the institutionalizing uh, that uh, Paul mentioned, um, that reinscribes itself every time we think, and with thinking, perhaps actively speaking, acting, practicing, experimenting. Yeah. Where are you situated in these times of transition and transformation? Well, I often um, borrow a quote, and I'll, I'll mangle it a little bit here, from Gatry Spivak, where she talks about there's no such thing as a non-institutional environment. And I think, you know, thank you, Paul, for what you said. Um, that no matter how we imagine ourselves not to be institutionalized, we are. The institution carries into all elements of our lives, unless we're completely off the grid in some remote place. And I think following what you said about Hannah and institutions are mechanisms by which communities speak to power. So when we think of an institution in primary colors, we think of those people that are institutionalized within institutions. 
We think about people in communities. We think about uh, people who transit back and forth, and we encourage that transition as much as possible. People should not stay in institutions more than five years. And then our fourth positionality is a place which Paul spoke to just now, uh, beyond institutions. And it's an imaginative, defined space which, uh, which encourages us to think about how we could live without institutions. In the meantime, institutions are there, and we have to uh, speak within them. That's just my initial thought to your question. Um, before, um, you know, for 10 years actually, or not that long, but we invented a place for transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary research and practice called Karai in Delhi um, from 2000, uh, and I think till about 2009, 2010. And I take on board uh, uh, what Chris just said, no one should stay in an institution that long. That was an interesting moment because there was a, a time in the city, like, the, you know, the, we were children of the 90s in that sense of, like, reflecting upon where our context and we were intersecting and the times. And so a certain kind of institutional, self-articulated institutional form seemed to be the opposite form at that time. Partly because even non-institutional places can seem institutionalized. We had come from documentary films, and it had become a very, very narrow, uh, self-defining, self-defined field. And I think this question of what uh, sees itself as having been institutionalized in that sort of old, you know, in that in that sense of the term, how aware is it of that? Whether it is an actual institution or not. So it really is a question of an awareness of power and how it plays that out and how it wishes to contain what gets articulated within that frame. Um, having made Sarai, I think it was, or having done Sarai for a number of years, it became uh, clear that the important thing is not, you know, so we were in, in documentary, which had become hardened and calcified to, at least it seemed to us, to trying to create a place at that time, um, not really prevalent in, at least in this part of the world, or in, you know, in Delhi, where there would be interdisciplinary practice and research and whatever that meant, and to, to open those questions up. And then to, then to saying, okay, no, this, we have to find a yet another way of doing it, which is neither the sort of self-oriented uh, nor uh, finding a specific frame. And I think some of the practices that I've been talking about in Rux, where there's a kind of inactive, propulsive, you know, propulsive energy that we take sometimes into institutional frames, to make both ourselves and the institution aware of what are both the limits and possibilities within that. And at this point of time, that seems to be working. But I would say that these decisions have to be, or these ideas have to be always considered contingent. I mean, uh, as Paul was you know, talking about, some of the questions that are being raised around the idea of the institution are not resolved and probably hold for, for way beyond that which calls itself an institution alone. Um, perhaps keeping the conversation, or as uh, Chris began by saying, and which is, is to acknowledge unknowing as a starting point, whether you're within the institution or out of it. Paul, any thoughts? Uh, I suppose I have maybe a response to your question from from like maybe three three different perspectives uh one is um i think monica always makes me think a little bit harder about things that i've been thinking about for quite a while uh which is why i um have so much time for for monica's thinking process but i was particularly triggered by the idea of what comes after what um and and this has something for me about uh situated practice like where 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 the value of my own institu institutions and uh curatorial practice may have leverage or may have agency or may have purpose or may be useful for others and i i i constantly get asked uh when when moving to Finland, um, 
being an Irish person who doesn't speak Finnish or doesn't have any family from Finland and who moved from upstate New York, uh, why did you move here and why, why situate your practice uh, in somewhere like Helsinki as opposed to New York or one of these more epicenter spaces of cultural production? And my, my thinking around that is what comes after what as monica says it's it's basically where there is no other place there is no there is no there is no better there is no worse this is it we're here and we're we're living it and our our lives have the purpose that it has uh in this kind of current moment of contingency and i I really am always troubled by this idea of the elsewhere, this idea that there's somewhere else somehow better or somehow somehow more purposeful or more open to the criticality of purpose that we all think that we we want to engage with and we all want to produce. And I I this is it. I mean this is <laughs> this is this is as far as it's as far as it's going to go for for for, for me and I think this what comes after what question is 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 very much about this idea of presentness and situated uh, presentness and i think that's um so maybe that's the first thing i wanted to say the second thing i wanted to say which was um uh the reason why we're working in this kind of para hosting our para curatorial way is 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 a kind of frustration um, with uh, anti-institution on one side and the kind of preoccupation with self-care on the other side. So I, I, I'm, 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 or we are trying to think about well, what is it outside of ourselves, and what is it beyond the antagonistic relationship with institutional building and with institutional context that we can we can function or, or or operate and that that means being open and being challenged by whatever comes in the door um and whatever whatever is near at hand whatever kind of bricolage uh political situation or context arises um uh, at a particular moment in time so uh, maybe, maybe that those two out of the three things that I wanted to say are perhaps, perhaps enough. Thank you, Paul and uh, Monica, Chris, Paul. Um, please um, speak up um, whenever you do um, as you're thinking. So um, I'm here as um, somebody to prompt, maybe a little bit, but also equally happy to say, stay quiet, and um, to listen. Um, what Paul mentioned just now about uh, the instituent reminds me of the word with that features in so many um, of the uh, strands of activities um, uh, that I see in collaboration um, between Shimmer and Publix across mm -hmm. the way with, on the waves with. Um, and I understand that Shimmer also has a program called um, Sunday Mornings With. So the withness, I wonder whether we can shift a little bit um, in our um, mode of uh, self-criticality, if we will, not to find an elsewhere, but to find reconstitutions of the threads that are already there. Um, so how might we think about um, institutions as um, always already constituted and shaped by state members in terms of bodies, in terms of minds, thinking, ideas, activities, practices, guests, um, the threshold um, rather than the boundaries or the contours of an institution is exactly about constituency. And perhaps there we might um, start moving towards the political, um, that which is always agonistic, that is that cannot be predetermined. Um, Otherwise, we're talking about authority of some kind, um, and it, that in itself is a different dimension, a very monolithic um, exercise of power. Um, so yes, as we're thinking about institutions and as um, Live Biennale is rethinking 
perhaps, um, the modes in which it constitutes itself, right? Um, that, uh, as Alham reminds us, uh, being the purpose of the very um, particular way in which uh, the live Biennale is gathering this year. How can we think about um, co-shaping um, and co-instituting through the idea of um, constitution as an activity, as an act? Well, I think if we think about institutions, especially in the way Paul was constructing them, um, there's an essential contradiction at the heart of any institution because it is a bureaucracy, it is an amalgamation of power. You could even say it's colonial to some extent. Institutions appropriate, they filter, they contain communities, and they dull the critique that comes from communities. They imagine the militancy and imagination of communities into public policies, into committees, and sometimes we don't even recognize our struggles within institutions. Having said that, and I don't want to take an anti-institutional position, Having said that, as you, as Monica pointed out, and, and as we've been talking, institutions are constructed by people. So how can, and the, in some cases, they're all we've got to speak power, to speak truth to power as the cliche goes. So if we imagine societies where institutional frameworks are falling apart, I think of Yemen, for example, or maybe Syria, for example, it's sort of like, oh, wait a minute, you've just critiqued uh, the liberal democracy and how it dulls communities, but on the other hand, without institutions, what have we got? A kind of a, a form of non-society uh, where hierarchies and power is exerted in much more hideous and torturistic kind of ways. So to answer your question directly of how we could rethink our relationship to institutions, maybe it's partly thinking of it as an ecology rather than an us and them kind of situation. We are all part of the arts ecology and institutions are part of that. For example, in primary colors, to make this real and to use a decolonial methodology, when we approach an institution for funding, for resources, for whatever we want from them, we don't approach it as a client-funder relationship. It's not about for us filling out grants and, and you know, ticking boxes and answering questions that the funders impose upon us. We approach every conversation with the idea of, you need us as much as we need you. So what do you need from us? We have something to offer. And so there's, we, we try to get away from the transactional and put the emphasis on the relational. And you better believe that institutions need us. They need the knowledge of communities. But the question becomes, what are the protocols for the enactment of that knowledge transfer? That's my response to your question, Sissy. I just want to come in on the word that you used to say, the word constitution. Um, and I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting word in the context of how um, formulations get constituted in terms of, you know, groups of people, um, the beginning of the institution in that sense. And the constitution is also a document that is self, you know, articulated, it is purported into the future. Uh, constitutions get written, constitutions become the kind of um, uh, perhaps the, the ideal or the kind of the, the, the standard by which perhaps the future can be measured by in relationship to, to a certain moment in time. But I think it's also important to think of the constitution as not being a manifesto. And I think this is where the notion of witness uh, becomes really important to us because um, you know, as a collective and as a collective that works with many, many, if you were to even look at ourselves, you know, whatever, bio, what, there's so many times that we have worked with, we have worked, the wit is very important. First of all, we work with each other, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the, the, what, one thing that we have said quite categorically is that the manifesto, in a sense, is, is, is a doctrine that has an end built in itself. So it, it denies witness beyond the point. It, it is a limited, the horizon is a limited idea. So it might be interesting to think of a distinction between constitution and manifesto and uh, see, you know, which mode it is, uh, which is the right mode, not right, but which is the, which is the mode that offers uh, witness in, in an open-ended way rather than uh, with limited time horizons. 
suppose we've been thinking a lot about um, different ways in which <clears throat> being with being with witness uh, um, is um, can be perhaps more 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 gentle than even than dialogical if i can say that so maybe less less about me and you and less about us trying to understand each other or or hearing what you have to say and hearing what i have to say less about that that to me already that to me already is is in it is beyond witness it's actually it's it's, it's it gets into power dynamics and authority and who's speaking on behalf of and and who who speaks first and second and who who like we're trying to do now give each other enough the same amount of time in between the questions and all of these kind of protocols and behavioral patterns that we either inherit or we respect of each other and i think what what we've been trying one of the things we've been trying to do in this reimagining of witness is is just to think about the gestures that are um are really uh trying to like maybe enact enact certain um, certain protocols so when we have a listening session for example we we really we really listen and I don't mean that we, I don't mean listening in the sense of like, we, we really understand each other or we really grasp each other. I mean, that's already too, too, too harsh or too violent in a way, but, but really we just listen. And there's no, there's no dialogue. There's no, everybody has the same amount of time, but, but they can use it or not use it. Uh, they can take it up, they can occupy it, uh, they can give it to somebody else. Uh, and it's really the act of, of listening. And then after a couple of hours of just listening to one another and really only listening, we only have our one moment to speak in this whole time of, of, of listening, uh, we, we stop listening. And then we think, okay, what, what are we going to do about that? How can, how can we act upon that? What actions... Are, are necessary what small actions uh can we take from from this period of listening uh and it may it, it's really necessary that it's something that isn't coming from uh, a dialogical perspective it's not something that i heard coming from you but it's something that 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 you may have said that i think requires action uh, and it's a it's it's a it's a more gentler way of, of and sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes it's so abstract and so complicated, and sometimes it's so angry and so emotional. And other times it's so it's so intense to listen to some to twenty people for for two and a half three hours and only listen is is sometimes enough of an action in itself. And we're really I may be trying to to think about these ways of being with one another that, that require action, but that we don't immediately get into this reactive or responsive uh, way of being with one another. So trying to solve each other's problems or trying to rush to resolution or trying to hear each other too quickly. And this is like maybe some of the very more gentle things that that we've been trying to do and and the shimmer project is maybe one way in which we've been doing that where we literally invite people to read something aloud and they do that however which way they wish to do it and they do that from different parts of the world and they have as much time as they need to do it and everybody gets uh, remunerated the same and every you know there's all these other ethical ways in which we already know how we should be with one another so we don't need to go through them continually but maybe maybe this witness um, does does connect to the idea of seeing differently as in, in in a kind of a witness way as well i think maybe there's a maybe there's a maybe there's a double a double emphasis there when you think about witness and witness so, yeah 
Thank you. Um, there certainly is um, something about perhaps not holding expectations, uh, but having um, the atmosphere move us, perhaps. Um, and that we sense all of this distinctively, um, given our own histories, our training, our backgrounds, um, and our approaches. We have Kate waiting patiently um, in the ask a question box. So Kate, if you unmute yourself, we should be able to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say there's some, some construction happening outside, so I hope the, you can hear me okay. I just want to thank all the panelists um, and live for uh, this morning's um, presentations and discussions. It's, uh, fantastic. It's so great to be in the community and I'm very grateful. Um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, apologize to, I believe your name is Chris CCK. Um, I, um, I'm the one who put in the chat, um, performance art uh, is performance art when artists, you know, say that it is. So I didn't mean to interrupt your, um, I didn't mean to interrupt your presentation. I thought it was a, a private chat, um, but I would like um, just to clarify that um, because I've been a fan of and um, uh, supporter of live uh, for many years and here in um, Canada you know we have artist run centers um, so that's a whole other institutional question but I'm really trying to get back to the um, uh, individual and mostly I'm thinking about live and its um, foundation as live art, as a venue for live art when it wasn't recognized, you know, in the uh, art institutions, it wasn't recognized in the canon, it, you know, it was an underground thing that um, got foundation for um, places like live and other places across Canada that doesn't. So my question is just to clarify around this idea around just this general umbrella of performance, instead of um, talking specifically about using language and semiotics to talk specifically about identity so that we have a means to talk about identity, intersectional identities, and really when we're doing live art, how different that is in the flesh and blood and sweat than it is, say, over you know other mediums. So I just I just uh, was hoping for some clarification around that. Um, thank you, Kate. Any thoughts from our panelists in response? Well, Kate, just to say I appreciate your apology, but it's not necessary. I have no problem with people intervening or asking questions. And I took your question as a provocation and tried briefly to respond to it. Um, as to the meaning of your question, I'm not quite sure I understand it. But I think you're talking about how identity and the different ways in which identity creates context of meaning. How can we deal with that in, in one room together, if you will, whether it's a room yeah. or, or whether it's virtual? And I think. Part of the beginning of that process, and it's a long process, this idea that somehow we're, I think both Monica and Paul have very articulately talked about this idea of uh, solving or knowing or researching and then coming to conclusions. Um, it's, it's a very Western way of understanding the world. And I think that even the, the word, you know, Linda Toy Switch, a Maori, a Smith, a Maori woman says research is a dirty word in indigenous communities because it defines, that's how we got these hierarchies in the first place. So just situating yourself in the colonial project in the world we live today, in the virtual world we live today, and decentering yourself from what you think is, what you think you know, um, is a beginning to do that. And the process of using one's history, one's ancestral knowledge, one's ancestors, one's contemporary identities, to situate yourself, decenters authority. And so, and, and my colleagues have spoken to this, this sense of unknowing is very important. And then after all of that, and after what Paul was talking about, taking time to listen before we speak, reminds me of the indigenous practice of the talking circle actually, 
and other cultures in the world where you talk and you talk for as long as you need to talk. You can't do that today. Then there's a way of saying, okay, identity is a form of layered meaning and it's just one positionality in polyvocality. And then that polyvocality aggregates meaning. I don't know if that's answering your question, but those are my thoughts. And please don't apologize. Um, I'm more at the, oh, no, yeah, no, I'm I, so um, beyond that. Um, I'm thinking more in, ter in terms of the importance of actually uh, using terms like performance art and live art and branching that out into identity politics and intersectional identity politics. So specifically, like as a queer person and as a feminist, I'm my, you know, I'm very much rooted and grounded in queer politics. So, you know, we need language such as two spirit identity, you know, lesbian, gay, queer. We need these types of identities, live art, performance art, embodied practice, you know, as a way to communicate. So when you, you know, erase that by saying we're just going to call it performance, then to me, that's, you know, not useful. Um, may I offer this? Um, also, as we are getting um, to um, the, the uh, temporary end um, of this discussion, um, there is a, a collective um, that is uh, based out of different educational and institution, uh, cultural institutions around the world, most notably um, Brazil um, and in South America and also the Pacific Northwest called Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. Um, and here I'm going to send a link through the chat for everybody um, to take a look when we have time. It's a gift contract. Um, lots of statements, a little bit manifesto-y, um, uh, per um, Monica's uh, caveat. But I think to Kate's point about uh, perhaps sometimes the temporary necessity of particular features that are meant to be transitional. So it's not so much that we relinquish or give words too much power, but at a moment when we're trying to perhaps coalesce for solidarity, and to act upon it, perhaps certain placeholders are in place. But whether we are ever ready to transform depends on how willing we are able to use responsibly and responsibly the kind of transitional language that brings us together. So yes, as Paul mentioned, yes, we can talk dialogically, but really it is about taking and making the time and the energy to be together, even when we disagree, even when there are um, particular concepts of which rub against um, our individual constitutions, that we remain open to that encounter. And I think that is something that we, or at least I have experienced in the past two and a half hours, including what Margaret and her friends brought to us to keep us um, grounded in many ways as we continue to speak and think um, perhaps in more, a more abstract manner, that we're reminded that we are also a material existence in the here and the now. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Paul. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to spend time with you today. Um, the next uh, couple of mornings will continue um, these points that the panelists today actually provided for us. Um, so I look forward um, to hopefully um, be an adequate host for those morning panels as well. But for now, a quick reminder that in half an hour or so, we would have Yasmin uh, Hueli Kalaora um, hosting, annotating the archives, uh, a special feature of this particular live assembly. So um, before, um, we close this session. I wonder whether there are any brief takeaways um, that Paul, Monica, or Chris would like to impart um, as an ending note, however temporarily. Just to say thank you to you, Sissy, and thank you to Monica, and thank you to Paul. Uh, 
Um, absolutely, it has been amazing to hear everyone. And I'm reminded of uh, a colleague in Cyber Mullah who told us a long time ago, uh, that radical speech needs radical listening. And I'm thankful to Paul for reminding us all for that, uh, for that again. Um, thank you, Monica, and also uh, great to hear everybody's, uh, great to hear from everybody today. And I maybe just uh, in response to the, the kind of like end note conversation, uh, I think it's um, important uh, as a self-defined queer intersectional feminist um, that uh, the boundaries and borders of disciplines and practices uh, embodied and disembodied are at the foundation of uh, queer feminist intersectional thinking. And I think it's up to uh, <clears throat> each embodied and disembodied being to try to find ways of um, redefining those boundaries and borders rather than fixing them and uh, stabilizing them and keeping them static and immobile and therefore unable to change. So that's maybe my last statement. Thank you. Awesome. So to stay dynamic, to stay moving, to stay live. Thank you very much uh, to our speakers um, and also uh, to our attentive uh, participants. Um, a huge heart. <laughs> to everybody. Um, thank you and um, enjoy the rest of your day and your evening and your night. Good night. Bye for now. Good night. <laughs>